Thank you very much, Reid. Uh, I think you would agree that we've got uh, three very interesting panelists who've raised a lot of interesting issues. Uh, I, we want to open uh, the discussion up, but I can't resist asking a few questions of my own. And the first question, I, I, I noticed, uh, Ray, uh, you ended with a few questions, and one of them had to do with balance. And I guess, uh, going back to Gary's uh, comment right at the beginning of the uh, panel, made me think about uh, internationalization from a business and financial perspective that, as an educator, I had this sort of innate, uh, averse reaction to. Uh, however, I mean, you made a very convincing case that it's a, a significant sector uh, and we need to be taking it perhaps more seriously and, and, and comparatively across the country for perhaps not doing as well as we could. So my question would be to all three panelists is how do you balance uh, the educational value, the educational with the financial, with the business perspective. How do we ensure that students have quality educational experience, whether they come here or ours, our students go abroad, and still um, consider uh, internationalization as a, as a, valid, a valid, uh economic sector for the province? Do it first. <laughs> um, I guess I have a bit of a problem with the assumption, not to be argumentative, but the assumption underlying that is that international students in the classroom will make it, will somehow drag down the learning environment or will somehow hinder um, the classroom. And I think it's actually the exact opposite. When it's done right, they really enhance the learning experience. When, when you think about having someone from another culture, from another country, in your classroom, you're bringing that country to your classroom. So the programs and the teachers that can really embrace that um, and do it well, uh, in fact, are enriching their programs. So I think it's not an either or, I think we can do both. I think it's improving the classroom, not detracting from it. Now there are a lot of challenges and a lot of hurdles, obviously. Language is kind of the one that's easy to see when you have students coming into their program and they don't necessarily have you know, the same language skills as a native English speaker. Um, and we could identify a bunch of problems, but I, I think we have to get beyond assuming that it's either or, and that international students are somehow a drag on the learning environment. Any other responses to my question? I think that your question, David, is it's really foundational. I mean, it, it kind of comes down to the public good versus private good. It's really what the purpose of the university, who is it for? Um, so uh, I think there's many things that you can pull apart in that in terms of trying to achieve the balance between having the resources required to establish and run quality programs, but then to uh, keep in mind why we're running these programs and what is the purpose and, and, and the yeah, I guess the grander picture. I think you know how you weave international into that uh, can be a really interesting and probably a very long discussion. So I'm just going to leave the comments there. Right? Yeah, I just I, I think you, you know certainly having spent uh, you know for, for me I'm relatively new in my role. I've been been at MITT for about eight months and have not had an opportunity to really look at the um, you know the component that is um, you know sort of the revenue generating side of. Uh, of international education, and I think it's, I think it, there's a bit, there's some, um, I think there's some some misnomers out there that, I mean, we're talking about public education institutions by and large. Certainly, um, you know, as Gary mentioned, privates, uh, you know, do have a role to play in this area as well. But but at a public educational institution, you know, any monies that are made on, on international student tuition are rolled back into enhancing quality and student services within the institutions. And you know we're not paying out dividends to shareholders, so I think you know we have uh, this reality that it is creating a sustainability. But the sustainability is not just being created for our domestic students. The sustainability is there to enhance the experience for our international students. Many of the indirect supports that would not be counted towards any money we would make off international, uh, those indirect student services and supports are actually um, be, are made possible by virtue of the fact that we have a certain critical mass of international students, and we're able to then create those kinds of opportunities. So I, I, I think it, you know, 
overall, um, it, it has been you know for, for us a positive experience and one where uh, I see there is a bit of a virtuous circle that does come from uh, the internationalization, both from the benefits in the classroom as well as from the revenues and what that can do to enhance the institution overall. I would like to add just one thing. I think it's really important that that we remember that when we're bringing international students to our campuses, it's not just them who are changing. We have to remember that we have to change as well. And uh, so it is a learning and growing, and that's not always a comfortable thing. One, one quick question. I have, to, I have to explore this, and Rhonda, you, you were very, in your comments, you, you, you shared some data on the percentage of students from international countries that that send their students abroad and, and how that compares to the Canadian data and of course the U of M data. Help me, help us understand why there's a, such a discrepancy in the, perhaps the government's position uh, in, in the value of international education. Um, is it, you know, and in particular, why Canadian students are not as apt to uh, travel abroad? Is it that we're not uh, telling the story well enough when students are in high school, for example, the values, is it uh, so this innate uh, perception that our educational system is superior, so there's no reason to go abroad? Um, is it what you mentioned, uh, Rhonda, an issue of transfer credit and a very awkward and unseamless uh, process for students to actually transfer credits across institutions internationally? You know, I think Gary kind of pulled out a really important point about the culture that we have. Um, I, I sometimes think about island North America. <laughs> we are linguistically um, and even somewhat geographically quite isolated from other countries in the world and I think our young people growing up are beginning to be aware of the fact that there is other cultures, other languages out there and I think the high school system is doing a fairly good job about incorporating that into either social studies or even into you know extended field trips and things like that so my kids are starting to ask can I go to Europe to study can I go down to Australia to study and that of course is something that I'm encouraging but until we get to the point where it's part of our psyche part of our way of thinking it's always going to be an add-on it's, it's a nice trip if you can afford it and if faculty members who are teaching courses and creating program requirements and things like that really understand and get into their mind, how does my program, how does my course fit into the world? How can I bring that global aspect into my course? Um, faculty members are the most influential instruments of internationalization on campus. It's not me. It's, it's, it's something. Gary, you're right. I know, I was just thinking something back to the last question, not this, uh, as an example of kind of what we're, we're facing. And, um, uh, I just read an article yesterday about Taiwan, and Taiwan's facing similar demographic trends as Canada is, and they're closing, I forget the exact number, but it's between 40 and 50 universities. They're closing. They're closing the universities. Just boom, they're done. Because they know they don't have the students to fit into them. Um, and so, I, you know, I, we can't imagine that kind of a stark, um, decision being made in Canada where we're just going to cross, and they only have 22 million people or whatever the number is in Taiwan, they're, they're smaller than us. Um, and so their answer is to go international and open up their schools to more Chinese students in order to keep the remaining universities vibrant. So I mean, back to that question, sort of, you know, the why, um, you know, looking at, we're not just, we're competing like across English speaking countries, but now more and more like, you know, other um, uh, universities in Asian countries, things like that, we're also trying to compete globally, so it's just this really um, hyper-competitive global market now. Um, but other countries are going to that same solution. You know, we need to look outside our own borders in order to keep our own universities vibrant. Okay, I think that was good. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just wanted. I was just going to make a general comment about the you know state of the world economy in terms of um, you know increased diversity, larger players emerging, globalization. Uh, the more that these effects take take root, the more that this is going to become an economic imperative for 
for uh, students in Canada to be able to get exposure to these other cultures that are going to be driving forces and already are um, in, in, our, in our global marketplace. So I think that that certainly you know, would be a, a further added benefit around, you know, if we talk about sort of the fortress of North America, you know, starting to find ways past that and, and moving, uh, moving into a great support for outbound internationalization efforts. Great.